facing the fears that ruin, ruin relationships. Amen. So we're going to talk about that today. If you'd open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start verse 6. We're going to start where all the problems started for us. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 6 through 19. This devil 
comes and tricks Eve into taking of the fruit. And if you read it, if you go through it in detail, read it, she kind of said, God said we were not supposed to eat it, but then she also added something to the rules, right? And we, we kind of tend to do that sometimes in ourselves. God said, don't eat of the tree, but then God, because she was being deceived, said, um, he says, I was, well, God said I shouldn't eat of the tree, but I also I shouldn't even touch the tree, which wasn't true, which is a lie that lie began, and doubt became into her mind, and she took the tree. Now, everybody said, you know, goes back and says, well, Eve sinned first, or did, did Adam sin first? Who, you know, what is the argument? Did the chicken come before the egg? The truth of the matter is, God told Adam before the woman was even created what he wasn't supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Alright, so it is the guy. Come on. It was the guy's fault. He <laughs> should have straightened up and took responsibility, but he didn't. Amen. So, come on, guys. Let's Amen. get it together, alright? So, there we go. Our Amen. relationships have been strained ever since. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we'll see why in just a little bit here. But I'm going to talk about two, uh, three different things. My fears of exposure, uh, um, three different facts. My fear of exposure makes me distant. Number two, uh, my fears of uh, disapproval makes me defensive. I get defensive when we don't, aren't, aren't in a good relationship. And my fears of losing control makes me demanding. How many people get de demanding? I'm, I gotta do it this way. I, not Glenda, I know not Glenda, I see her shaking her head. So I, this is like really good, everybody's already going yes and no to the sermon, so I didn't get to the points yet, so this is really good. So you know, what happens is that when we lose control, uh, we become demanding and we ruin relationships. Uh, true, there's a lot, um, uh, there's a lot of you that don't, uh, there's a lot of us, the first point, let's go back to that, my fear of exposure makes me distance. Adam and me realized they were naked. They were exposed. They were everything. They, everything was revealed to them, right? Now all of a sudden they tried to hide. So your fear of exposure. So when you build relationships with people, we never really tell the other person. Usually, not even our own wives or our own husbands sometimes who we really are. It's like we give ninety percent of ourselves, but we don't give the other ten percent. We kind of hide that. We're afraid that if you know the other part of me, that you're going to judge me. Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna you're gonna accuse me, of, you know, you're not gonna like me, or you're not gonna accept me, right? So we're, we're afraid of exposure, afraid to do that on a, on a date, if you're dating, or and even in a relationship already with uh, coworkers or we with your bosses, we we kind of show our we want to show that we got it all together. We want to show them that hey, you know, it's okay, we're good, but we're not gonna share the rest of ourselves. It takes a lot to be totally open to each other, isn't it? It takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of uh, uh, knowing one another before we're fully uh, aware of who we are. But it's interesting that God already knows who you are. Mm -hmm. God already knows all your faults. He knows everything about us. He knows all our secret sins. He knows everything that everybody else doesn't know about us. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He still loves you. Amen. 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 He still wants you to be perfect. He still wants to take you and change you. He wants to form you into his image. God created man and God created woman in his image. And I was, uh, I just got a card uh, in the mail today. Uh, well, I didn't get the mail this week, but it was in there. It's from the, the solemn assembly that we had last week. And they had asked me to uh, share with them, I think I shared this last week a little bit, share with them about the two commandments, to take two commandments and share some inner reflection thoughts about those two commandments. So I picked the one that says, do not use the Lord's name in vain. The other one I picked is honor your mother and father. And I shared this last week. But the one about, uh, the, the, the first one about not, do not taking the Lord's name in vain, everybody kind of relegates that to not cursing. Right? Because that's just what it says. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. That means you shouldn't curse. But when you study that word out vain, you study do not in, mm -hmm. in the Greek, it actually means do not take on, do not wear, right? Uh, do not put on God, or so don't say you're, this is what I interpret, Pastor Bob's interpretation, do not put on the title Christian and act like a fool. Mm -hmm. You're representing God, but you're not acting like that. You're taking the Lord's name in vain. Mm -hmm. Alright, study it out for yourself, you'll see. It's more about what we're doing than what we're saying. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, so i got to change my heart, i got to change me, so I can speak the things of God. The other one was honor your mother and father. 
And that was uh, really great that you had complimented or asked, thank me for that. Because some of the, the people in the church there was, uh, was an older group of people, and they had uh, elderly moms and dads. And so they were, some of them were in nursing homes and things like that. So they had, uh, he said, there's several people that had now uh, attended or wasn't seeing their family members more just since we were there. So that was really nice. So, you know, we need to not forget about our mommies and dads. And so anyway, uh, that was that was free. Uh, that was extra. But anyway, so relationships. Go ahead through uh, My fear of exposure. Look at uh, Genesis 3, uh, 9 and 10. Says, um, 3, 9 and 10. Says, God called Adam. Where are you hiding? Why are you hiding? Adam said. I was afraid because I was naked. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. God always knows the answer to the question, doesn't he? He asked the question, but he knew where Adam was. He wanted him to admit what was wrong with him, right? Admit that you have a problem. Admit that you're hiding. Admit that you are not doing what you're supposed to do. A circle, a circle in your Bible says, I, I was afraid. Circle in your Bible, I was afraid and I hid. Fear always causes us to hide. Right? Fear, or what do you say? Sin always causes us to hide. Sin always causes us to be real work with us all. Well, I know I should go to a Bible study on Monday night, but I'm afraid because I get there, if I go to Pastor Bob's house, we're going to talk about stuff. And we're going to examine ourselves. And, you know, it's going to, you know, I don't want to really know who I am. But you know what's interesting? As we, can, as we begin to reveal ourselves to each other more and more, which we, you know what? Let me just back up for a second, because this is really important. The same spirit that is in you, is in me, right? <laughs> if I'm a believer, the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit is in me, correct? So if the same Spirit is in us, the same Spirit bears witness to you that you're a child of God. I bear witness that you're a child of God, and you bear witness that I'm a child of God. The same Spirit that is in Tina is in me. Come on. The same Spirit that is in, in, in me. We all have the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. So the Holy Spirit reveals to us things that are not right with each other. Can you say amen or oh my? Mm -hmm. This is, I used to freak me out. Go to church and my pastor, Pastor Stenson, would come up to me and go, Oh, so you and Tina have been arguing all the way to church today, huh? Mm -hmm. like, How do you know that? I mean, I thought I put on the happiest face, <laughs> walking through the door. How would they know that? How does he know that? Because he knows there's something wrong. When we, when we see you guys and, and we're praying for you, you know, Tina and I, we see when something ain't right, right? We don't know what the sin is. We just know something isn't right. And we want to make it right because the Lord does it. He wants to bring us in the full relationship so we can have the fullness of God in us. But we're, we, 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 we are fearful because we don't want to be exposed and want our faults and our failures to be exposed. And the enemy, does, he just tells you, don't tell them. Don't tell them because they're going to judge you. They're going to make you, not, you're not going to feel good. You're going to feel rejected. And that's exactly the opposite of who God was. Because think about God the Father went to Adam and Eve. <laughs> he didn't reject them. He had a punishment for what they did, but he didn't reject them. He, even in that moment, God loved Adam and Eve. But because of their disobedience, there was a punishment coming, right? God loves them. He knows you're, when you're exposed, you're vulnerable. You're open to all sorts of, of things that are not good for you. You're unprotected when you're, like, when you're naked. Right? When you have sin and you haven't revealed that, you, you're just unprotected and God's protection is not with you. Uh, the deepest fears of being a saint, uh, of what we really are, is reality. We really want to know. Okay, the, um, damage from, uh, the damage fear does to relationship happens in three stages. One, the first one, verse 7, 8 says, shame. They were shameful. How do you know they're shameful? They, they actually took fig leaves and tried to sow them. Do you know how big a fig leaf is? <laughs> I mean, fig leaves like little, I mean, they're little. I know they always show the pictures in the Bible or in the kids' Bible, they show big leaves and stuff. I just, I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of funny to take a lot of leaves and cover me up, I guess. But um, they, were shame, they, were, they, they were shameful because of their nakedness. Fear is often based in shame. We're ashamed because of what we did wrong. We know we did something wrong. We feel shame. We hide. Amen. The other part is we cover ourselves up. We cover ourselves up with, with other things. You know, we want to make ourselves look good. You know, we want to have the nice clothes, we want to have a nice car, we have nice things, we want to cover up. We don't want people to really see who we are. We have to put on this front. Amen? And that doesn't happen in this church at all. But you know what I'm saying? People do that. Right? We try to put on a different front than what we really are. 
what happens when you have this relationship where you can be more open and more exposed and, and the glory of God can dress us and change us and our identity is not no longer in our things, but it's in our relationship with Him. Amen? Uh, my identity is not in what I do, but it's what, who He is. My identity is, oh my goodness, I am a child of God. It's not about anything else I do on this earth. Amen? I am a child of God. I love saying that song because it reminds me like God, even though I hid from God, He came and found me. Amen. Right? When I was in my sin, before I became a, a, a believer, I mean, God found me. He pursued me. He, was, he, he goes, hey, Bob, I see you over there in that jail cell, but, you know, I'm still here. Would you come out? Let me, let's talk about this. Let me, let me, so what did you do now that I wasn't supposed to? You, you ate at the tree? Huh? You did all these things? He already knows, right? He knew the answer. He knew what was going on. He said, okay, come here. I want to come here. I want to I want to change your life. I want to forgive you. The other thing that happens is we get we go distant from each other and from God. Right? When we sin or we have problems in our lives, we don't know what nobody do uh, know about it. Then all of a sudden we, we stop attending church. We stop associating with people that are that are believers, and we just do our own thing. We just isolate ourselves. That's what the enemy does. I like to. You ever watched a video um, in Africa where they show like that the lions attacking like the five uh, um, elk or or, or whatever African animals. Uh, I can't think of the right gazelle. Now. But you know, yeah. the gazelles, there you go, we'll go with the gazelles. So the gazelles are running around, the lions are trying to, they circle them, right, as, as a private lions, they get around, they circle them, and all of a sudden they, they, wait, they wait, and they wait for the weakest one, right? And they're kind of outside that, the, 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 uh, the protection of all the other ones, right? And all of a sudden, they jump on that one little animal and they eat it up, right? That's what the enemy does to us. I have a story one time about, um, it's, it's a true story. There's a gentleman that lived, I think it was north of South Dakota, and he had a, a in, in, those, in that area, very rural, so, you know, little farmers and little villages or whatever your little uh, house all over. So they have a local church, one church, that, you know, everybody just kind of goes to, you know, and I don't know what denomination or whatever it is, but there's one farmer just decided not to start attending church, so he stopped, right? And he was alone, his, his wife had had passed, he's by himself, you know, and he's kind of isolated in, in, in his everyday life, but, you know, he'd come to church, but then he stopped coming. And this pastor, you know, I mean, you have so many people in that town, he, that he never named, he knew their lives, he knew everything about them, and he's got to stop coming. So then, one day, one evening, he felt that he should go visit him. So he goes visit him. In his house, he had a fireplace. So the gentleman was sitting, knocked on the door, he let him in, or he told me to come in. He was sitting on a chair, watching the fireplace. And the fire was going and going and going, and uh, the pastor sat down. They didn't say anything. Say hi. He's kind of sat there. He sat with him, you know, knowing he's hurting because his wife had passed, and you know, maybe can't do the things he used to do or whatever. But he was, you know, he just wanted to sit there with them. And the pastor, after a time, got up, went over, took one of the smaller logs that was in the fire, and just picked it up, not with hands, but you know, common, and he just moved it to the side. And he sat back down. They watched the fire and watched the fire. What happened to that, that little log? Because it wasn't with the rest of the fire, what happened? It just started going up, right? So it was smoldering, 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 until it was almost out. And then the pastor got up and left. What was he saying? You're not strong by yourself. You don't have the flame of God. You don't have the power of God in you. We need each other, right? That's why God called us sheep. We need to take care of each other. We need to be with each other. We need to encourage each other. So we need to have, we don't need to hide when we're sinning in our lives, right? Matter of fact, James, what I was quoted at earlier, and I think I was going to use it right now, but James tells us if there's sin in your life, if there's something wrong, right? Call for the elders of the church. We'll come and we'll pray for you. We won't judge you. Right, Richard? We're not going to come and judge you, right? We'll just come pray for you, right? <laughs> we'll lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, you know? We'll hug you, we'll cry with you, we love you. Right? Because that's what God wants us to do. Amen? So don't uh, be distant. Keep close to God. Then God hid. Uh, then he hid from God in the trees. That's the verse number two. May, uh, my, fear um, my fear of disapproval makes me distant. We can talk about that. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. It says, God asked, did you eat? They told, um, they told you. Uh, I did I tell you not to eat? The answer is, says, you gave me this woman, and she 
gave me the fruit. <laughs> what happened right away? We're going to blame somebody for our mistakes, right? Is it, do we do that naturally? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Huh? Yeah. Do we do that? We, okay, I'm just, you know. He wasn't, uh, wasn't any more willing to accept responsibility. Let's look at this, verse uh, 12 <laughs> and 13. 12, the man said, the woman you gave, you put it, the, now he didn't even blame the woman, but he also blamed God. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> right? I mean, like, God, you gave me this woman and she made me eat it. <laughs> Like, I mean, and he's like, come on, guys, let's get, you know, let's uh, get a backbone or something, you know, let's take some responsibility, man, you know, I mean, let's, this is where it all, you know, we can blame Adam for our weak backs, guys, we can blame Adam, but let's not blame Adam, let's just be different, right? And then it's really cool because even the woman said then, right, and saying, then the Lord said to the woman, what is, what have you done? And immediately, she blames the snake, yeah. right? She blinked at she, she, she the state. Well, she knew what happened. See, this is interesting, gentlemen. This is what this is a responsibility we have. This, is, this maybe we'll get into this next week. But the woman got deceived. Mm -hmm. The man just said, "No, God said, Amen. right, and we would never have this problem. Yep. You guys Amen. would have perfect marriages if we didn't have we, they didn't mess up back then. You know, we didn't have sin in this world, right? So then, then, um, then he then said, "I eat it." So then the Lord said to the serpent, "You know, that goes next." But I mean, here we go with the blame game. Every time we make a mistake, now is it just me or is it like all of us that do that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everybody does it, right? Yes. Huh? Yeah, we just pass it on. This, I, you know, we say it's, you know, like, oh, can I get into this? Okay. Uh, you know, I grew up in a poor home. I didn't have this stuff. You know, I, we got excuses. The whole our society is built on excuses. We blame our education system, we blame our parents, we blame our grandparents, we blame the guy down the road, you know, we blame everybody but ourselves. We don't take responsibility. Absolutely. But when you take responsibility for your actions, what begins to happen? This I teach this to our guys all the time. They know everything about our lives. We don't hide nothing from them. We know they know everything about everything we've gone through these last eleven years. There's no secrets. Why? Because when there's a secret or when there's something hidden or think pastor got it all together, then when things fall apart, then oh my god, I thought you were no, I'm not that pastor. I'm not gonna present that to you. I will never present that to you. I'm glad you gave us flowers. I, that's probably as much as I would accept. Right? You guys know I'm not gonna accept anything else. That's just not what I am. I'm here to serve you. And they're here to serve you too. And they're learning how to do that. And we'll learn to serve each other. Amen? God has something. When we can confess our faults to one another, it says our sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. What happens? We don't, I don't want to share deep secrets in my heart with you. I want to hide those. Mm -hmm. But when we open up, then all of us can be that way. And then the enemy cannot use it against you. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Enemy will take whatever you're hiding and put bondage on you. will shackle you. Well, you'll be crazy trying to get rid of that. You'll be in so much bondage. You, there's no freedom in God then. Mm -hmm. All our sins should be exposed. All of those can be forgiven. God can take care of anything. I've heard everything. There's nothing that I don't think I can. I mean, I don't know. I've heard so much, but I say, yes. Maybe you're like this right now, but God can change you. I believe the word says that all things become new. So let's confess this. Let's believe that God can forgive you. Understand the power of the blood of Jesus. He can cleanse you from unrighteousness. That's what it says. And make you righteous. Amen. I'm not righteous of my own. I'm righteous because of what Jesus did for me. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. That's why we can come on Sunday morning and just celebrate. Have a heart of worship. My heart is, I know I'm forgiven. I was bad, but now I'm good. Hallelujah, God, you did it for me. That's why we're here on Sunday morning. We're not here just to let, you know, I'm glad we have a, a piano. I, I, I wish we had a guitar player and a bass player like the Spanish church does, you know? But you know, we don't. But it's not about all that. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to help encourage you to worship God. Hallelujah, I have a heart because God cleansed me. God changed me. God set my feet on a solid rock. I now have a new life in Him. I'm changed. I was destined for hell, and now I'm going to heaven. My punishment for what I did in my life was not anything good. There was nothing good in me. But when that day, when God came down and touched my life, and I said, yes, God, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Get, this is my prayer. 
I was in I was in the brig at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Back then, there was a lot of drugs in the military, like there probably always is, not always is. But anyway, back then there was a lot. They were cracking down on that. So a lot of people in the brig with me were these these uh, higher ranking people that were selling drugs to the troops. That happened in the late seventies. Vietnam guys, you know they, you know. Anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. So I was at the brig, and I and I remember after I had, had prayed and accepted Jesus, wrote in my Bible that I accepted Jesus Christ January 25th, 1970, uh, 1980. Then uh, that evening, that evening, it was, it was a Wednesday, that evening I prayed this prayer, God, get me out of here and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I was out in three days. Amen. I was supposed to be in there for six months. I was out, they came to get me. I thought I was going to Fort Leavenworth. Pack your bags, Castro, you're out of here. Bag. I mean, like, okay, whatever, God, you know. And, and I get my stuff up. Hurry up! All right, I get up there. I get up to where I'm supposed to go, and you're, you're follow me. So I didn't even know where I was going. They followed. They took me right to the front of the, the, the jail, out the jail, and they handed me over to a driver from my battalion. I'm like, I said, what's going on? He goes, I I'm taking you back to the battalion. I'm like, all right, let's go. You know? <laughs> I was free. Amen. I was free, I was free, I was out of there. And God restored everything. God does that. He, everything I would have lost, I gained double. Amen. I gained more double, man. I was like married to one of three or four times, four times, and put in for a master gunnery sergeant, married to a promotion also, because they wanted me to stay in for another two years. And I said, no, nah, sorry, I'm not going to do that. That's a nice write-up, though. Um, but yeah, because I served God. I was 20 years old. I served God. I'll, I want to serve God until I take my last breath. Amen? <laughs> God can change. So whatever you have, God wants to take you away. Matt right here knows about it. Amen? <laughs> Number three, my fears of losing control makes me demanding. Hallelujah. How many get a little grumpy when you're out of control, right? Hey, you know, I mean, that's not me at all. But, you know, when you can't control things, God is a guy thing, really, you know? I mean, this is both men and women, but, I mean, guys have this problem. So when things are out of order, we get grumpy. When things aren't right, we get a little anxious, right? We, we start saying, no. We, when, when things aren't working, I wish Angel was here. Angel had to go pick up his daughter. But he, he said, Pastor, I know you. You know, I, you, you, you can get a little grumpy sometimes, you know? And uh, I love Angel because he's a little older, so he can, I can say things to him, you know, that's a little different than maybe some other people. We have this relationship that's... You know, I can just be real with them, right? So we're working on stuff in the church and something breaks, and you know, I might get a little frustrated because I have to run to the hardware store again. He just, he's there, you know, to, like laugh at me, you know, kind of thing. Let's get this done, gotta get this done. But when, when things are out of control, we just get like so. Oh, I mean, did you do it that way or just me? Just me. <laughs> That's what I thought. I get that. I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still working on it. Thank you, Glenda. You know, I, if I could just be like Glenda. Oh, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. If I could just be like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're just being real, you know. I mean, sometimes it's very difficult when we not control something that we act out of anger. Yeah. It's what men do all the time. We go home from work. We work so hard. We come home. Tina's in the house with three babies, and the house looks like a tornado hit. <laughs> and you know what my first words used to be? What did you do all day? <laughs> you know what I love the wife to say? She's, I mean, she's a saint. She should get like, when she goes to heaven, she has her own little palace, you know, and a uh, little work. But she's like, I'm going to take care of children. She didn't think she was going to get mad at me. She never, you know, I was stupid, but, you know, I, I, I learned, you know. And then I learned. I come home, and I put my, you know what I do now? If, if, if the day is frustrating for me, because of whatever, before I get into the house, I leave it outside. Mm -hmm. So I used to tell her, I learned this when I was a captain too, because I used to drive through the gate, so I had to drive home from where I work, off the base, and I went, we lived out in town, and so when I, worked, when I left the gate, in my mentally, mentally, my spirit, I would leave all my military stuff behind. So at the gate, I would say, okay, I'm taking off my pack, here it is, and I'm going to be Bob, a husband of Tina, you know, loving person, that's what I did. And it changed the way I did things because of the frustrations of work. She doesn't need to carry that. Mm -hmm. Right? She already got all these little ones. We had five kids, so, you know, she had 
her hands full for many years, right? She don't, I don't, she don't need to meet my burden, right? I need to go in there and help her change some diapers and feed some babies and clean up the floor and play with them, you know? And, uh, and that's what you learn to do. But, you know, I, 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 the control thing is really difficult. So we're gonna, we want to get a little grumpy when we're not in control of things. Come on, if you say amen or owe me either okay. way, amen. It says, so what's, I remember, oh, I remember, uh, I remember my friend Chip and Kim, I wrote this down last night. Chip and Kim were our friends. We had, we had the awesome opportunity to lead my friend uh, to Jesus. Uh, Chip was one of those guys that was really funny because when he got saved, he got saved, right? He had all the, all the weird music, he did all the acid and marijuana. I mean, he was just a crazy guy, right? And we used to pick him up for church and he'd still be tripping, but he would bring him to church anyway, right? And he would sit there and, and you know, he'd be in the, this uh, conviction, but he didn't know what to do about it. It was kind of fun watching him, but you know, that's probably mean, but you know, I just wanted to be <laughs> in God's presence, you know? But he can't, he got saved. When Chip got saved, it was so, uh, I remember that week he got saved during the week, but then Sunday was coming, so he was going to drive to church. We we're going to meet us at church. Usually we picked him up. And uh, uh, do you remember that day? <laughs> so here's my friend, right? Now, remember, we got this is in the 70s, and disco was still kind of one of those things, <laughs> right? So all his suits were those uh, belt bottoms, disco. right? Disco white with the blue powder blue uh, collar with the big collar. Look it up on the internet. They still, I don't, I'm sure you can still buy one. And the shoes, you know, platform shoes, you know, yeah. And and then he knew that he's going to church, so he needed a Bible. So Chip goes to the PX, which is the post exchange, which, which is like a Target, right? He goes there and he buys a Bible. He buys this family Bible because that's the only Bible they had. They had these big Bibles like this. So here's Chip. I, mean, I almost lost it laughing so hard because here's my friend. First time he's come to church on his own, totally clean from the drugs, took all his music and threw it in the trash. God just radically, I mean, changed his life. New creature in Christ, smiling on his face, his suit, and his big old Bible coming to church. Oh my goodness. I laughed so hard. I, I was standing right. It was so funny, but I would know he's coming because he's a new person. Mm -hmm. God changed him. God changed his life. It totally ratified his life. He was, uh, and I was going to talk, I was going to talk about that. I missed that whole thing. I was going to talk about the Kim and, Kim and Chip because then Chip got married. That's all right. Chip got married and him and his wife used to uh, argue a little bit. Uh, Chip, Chip, and, Chip and Kim were like opposites. They were like totally opposites. Uh, they would have fist fights in the living room over who's going to clean the floor. <laughs> I mean, I mean, fist fight. I mean, Kim was a. I mean, Chip was 105 pounds. And Kim was 105 pounds. I remember like just you know little firecrackers, and they would they both had attitudes to go with it, you know. And they never learned to. <laughs> they did learn eventually, but they were just. They were, and they would come to us and say, hey, you got to go see pastor. I don't, know. I don't know how to help you guys at all. You know, don't hit each other. That's probably a good place to start, you know. Uh, but they love each other today. They're still married. She's an amazing couple. But anyway, uh, they had, that's where the, the, the fight began um, in Genesis. This is where the problems, guys and gals, this is where the problems started. Right here. The man blaming the woman and the woman blaming the man. But let's look a little bit deeper here. Let's go, let's go down to the responsibility of the man and the woman. It says, then, um, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. How many can say women had babies? Mm -hmm. You have pain in childbirth? You know, if you're a believer, God said he'd help you with that, though, right? Mm -hmm. He did. But this is where the pain came, right here. Because I guess before that, there was no pain in childbirth. Uh, amen. There was no childbirth. Mm -hmm. huh? Or maybe there was, yeah. maybe there was no childbirth yet. It, it was coming, though. You know, they had to multiply and replenish the whole earth, so a lot of babies coming. And then he says, um, with pain, and you will give birth to children. Your desire will be towards your husband, and he will rule over you. This is, this is a curse, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. This is not the blessing. Yep. Amen. All right, the blessing is when you obey God, we'll talk about that in love later, but this is what happened. So now the woman feels like, she should be in charge, and the man, because desire was towards your husband, and the husband's going to rule over, what it says, right? And the mm -hmm. husband will rule over you. Yeah. Who wants to be ruled over? Mm -hmm. no. uh, it's not healthy when you think about it this way, because I'm over you, you have to listen to me, and then you have all the weird Christians that put stuff that doesn't even, isn't true in the Word of God. Yeah. 
on top of that. Mm -hmm. So you have to follow the word of God. Love conquers all of this. But this is where the battle comes from. When you're battling with your wife, we never battle, really not. Uh, so, you know, but I mean, other couples do, I know, you know, some people have a little difficulty and stuff like that. And this is the problem. Yep. So we have to understand why we're upset with each other. The reason we're upset is because of this curse. So you can come against that curse. Because Jesus healed all of that. Yes. Come on. Jesus Amen. made it all right. So this was a curse in Genesis, but then it didn't have to stay that way because now we're believers. We are restored as sons and daughters of Jesus, right? And now we go back to what we were in the garden. We now, because of, not because of our righteousness, because of Jesus, we are now restored to what we were before in the garden. Yep. Now the man has to lay down his life for his wife. And now the man has to die for her. <laughs> Hallelujah. With great joy I die for my wife <laughs> and for all of you. Come on. So that's the way it is. So now this was the curse. But so when you find yourself battling with the wife, the woman, or the man that God gave you, this is why. Mm -hmm. It can be healed because of love. Amen. See, love overcomes everything. If you go back, to, we'll talk about Ephesians next week a little bit more about how the man is supposed to love the wife and the wife is supposed to honor the husband. Amen. Because the husband is weak in his, his mind. He needs a, he needs, a, we, men need encouragement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how God designed us. And guess what? He gave me a helpmate that does that. Amen. And I'm supposed to be a protector and a provider. And she feels secure. That's how God designed it. Amen. Amen. That's how, and then, then we have harmony in our relationship because she feels secure. I feel honored, and we live as one. Amen. It's an amazing thing. I love my house. I love my wife. There's peace in my house. I love coming to my house. Amen. I can't wait to get to my house. I leave work early to get to my house. I'm, my wife is there. I want to be with her. Amen. I love that. It's, it's a, I just can't wait. All right, it's 2.30. Can I, I should stay at 3, but I'm going to leave early anyway. How is it? So I can be with my wife. Amen. God made it all right. Amen. It made it good. Before I was a Christian, uh, we weren't really that messed up, were we? Yeah. yeah. We didn't have, you know, seriously, before we were Christians, we were just so young, we didn't know nothing. We got married when we were 18. We had a clue about nothing, you know? So we just like... Hell, we, you know, okay, we gotta pay the bills, you know, okay, we got three dollars eighty four cents left over for groceries. Okay, good. You know, I mean, we, you know, God just blessed us as we began as believers. God has blessed us and blessed us and blessed us so much. So love, what is the answer to all this stuff? Love. It's love. The antidote for being scared, for being fearful, for not for hiding, for all the sins that are coming up is love. Let's look at First John four eighteen. First John four eighteen. <laughs> There is no fear in love. So the first thing that happened was Adam and Eve, there was fear on them. They hit. Yep. They covered themselves up. Fear, fear. Anytime you have fear in your life, that's not God. You walk in your house, you have fear. You command the fear to leave in the name of Jesus. And you, you just act, accept God's love. God loves you. He doesn't want you to be in fear. Amen? Fear. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with what? Punishment, mm -hmm. And we do not receive punishment any longer because Jesus cleanses us from our blood. We don't have to feel guilty anymore. Amen. We don't have to worry about punishment. If you said yes to Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. When you said yes to him, guess what? The punishment of your sin is gone. Amen. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus cleanses you. And no longer are you that person that you were before. And as a believer, and I believe in progressive sanctification, I believe you're continually growing in that, and as the Holy Spirit reveals to you things in your life that's wrong, then you confess it, because otherwise you'll harbor that and fear will come in your life. Mm -hmm. You'll feel judged in your life. You'll feel not accepted in your life, because you're not totally open and confessing things. That's why it's so important that you understand that fear is, is the presence of evil. Fear is not from God. Can I say that again? Fear is a presence of evil in your life. Love drives out all fear. What? what if I'm fearful? I'm alone at night in my house. I feel fearful. Put on a praise music. Open up your Bible. Call somebody that's a believer. Drive that out in the name of Jesus. You don't have to be that person. Amen? Verse, um, uh, the second 
part to drop lies out all fear. So that little that little part of you that you haven't exposed, that little part of you that you don't want to uh, be seen, that little ten percent, that that part that you don't let everybody you you hide because your personality you don't want to be open to people. That's is not be, it's not being revealed because of fear. God wants to take that away from you today. God wants you to be real and free from the bondage of your past. But Pastor, you don't know all the junk I did. God, God knows. I don't have to know. But as long as you keep it in your heart, away from everybody, then you're at a distance. You're at a distance from everybody, and God can't come in and change you. Okay, God, you can change this much with me, but this much I'm keeping for myself because it's really bad. But God already knows it's really bad. Right? God already knows the secrets of your life. He wants to expose them because once you confess, that's what I tell the guys, I said, once you confess them, once you open up, once you share those things, and it can't easily get you any longer because now it's not a secret. Right. It's out in the open. When it's out in the open, then we can take care of it. Amen. 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 Well, that's really bad, God, Linda, but guess what? You're forgiven in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I accept you because I know you're a child of God. Amen. Amen. I'm not judging you. God loves you, and I love you. Amen. Amen. That's, I mean, it's a change. Can the church get a hold of this? Can the church get a hold of this? Instead of pretending to be Christians on Sunday morning, can we actually be open to each other enough to just worship God freely, love on Him, and let God change our lives so we, we can reflect the very image of God? It's love. Love changes it. Amen? Love. Every day. This is what I want you to do every day. I mean, you don't have to do this, but I want to encourage you, okay? There's three things. Every day, surrender your heart to Jesus. You get up in the morning, God, I give you my life. I give you my heart. Whatever you want to do, God. Every morning, before you even think of anything, after you read your Bible, like, I got to get up, get up. God, I surrender my heart to you. Open the eyes of my heart. Open my heart, God. That's what we say. God, open my heart to you, Lord. Don't let, like Joe said, look at, um, if you, could you turn to Joe? Is that up there? No. Job 11, 33 says this. Listen to this. this is, go and start to listen to your Bible. This is, I want you to read this tomorrow when you get up. Job 11, 13, 13. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to Him in prayer. And give up your sins. Even those that even those you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You will not be confident uh, or confident or fearless. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like waters beneath a bridge. And your darkest nights will be brighter than noon. Then you will be safe and secure, full of hope and empty words. Let me read it again. Listen, wait, listen to your heart, please. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to Him in prayer. And give up your sin, even those you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like waters underneath the bridge. And your darkest nights will be bright as noon. Then you'll be, then you'll rest, safe and secure, filled with the hope, and empty from all worry. Amen. Job chapter 11, 13 through 18. It's a little shorter version, of it, but that's what it says. Job in that's it's part, it's part uh, 13 through 18. It's, a, it's, the, uh, it's a different version, but that's what I said. Think about it. You go to God, get up in the morning, and you say to Him, I surrender my heart. I give everything to you, Lord. And you'll take all your problems and wash them away like water goes underneath the bridge. God, take all my worries away. Take all my sin away. Take all of me away. Anything that's hindering people from seeing you, Jesus, take it away. Then number two, the second thing I want you to do is every day I want you to remember the ways God loves me. You are a child of God, right? I am completely accepted. Say this. I am completely accepted. I am completely accepted in God. Amen? He accepts you the way you are. I am unconditionally loved. You don't have to earn God's love. He just loves you. Amen? You don't have nothing you have to do. Wow, oh, put that in your thinker for a moment. There's nothing you have to do to earn God's love. How many in your whole life you've earned trying to earn like good grades at school or trying to get approval by people, you know, do the best job at work so you, people like you. You don't have to do that with God. He already loves you. He loved you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He loves you before you created the foundation of the world. That blows my mind. I think about that often. That before he even said, okay, I'm going to make a world. I'm going to make seas and animals. I'm, he already knew me. 
That's awesome. He knew I'd be here today, and he knew you'd be here today. Amen? Amen. And this is another thing that you can throw in your thinker. In Romans, uh, it says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are totally forgiven. Amen. You are, you are totally forgiven. The only thing that happens sometimes is the enemy will bring back to your thinking the things that you did wrong. And you can say, no, I already asked God to forgive me. I am forgiven of that. And we have to remind ourselves that we're not that old person. We're a new creature in Christ. So those things are past. All things are new. So I'm going to start serving God, right? And God, and let me tell you, we're never done and we're never finished. We're always being changed. So that's good. But we don't have to bring up the old past. I'm not that person anymore. Amen? Amen. Uh, uh, I am considered extremely valuable. How valuable are you? How valuable are your things? I have a gold watch, or you're worth this much money, or my house is worth this much money. Well, how valuable are you? What, what price tag do you put on Jackie? Jackie, you are you are this valuable. Huh? How about what? A million dollars, but maybe I feel like a hundred dollars, right? Or whatever. God looks at it, you're invaluable. You're so valuable that God sent the Son to die for you. That's how valuable you are. You are valuable. You are valuable in God's eyes. He loves you. You were bought with a price and paid through Jesus' death. He paid heaven. He bought you. So He owns you. Oh, we don't get a death today. But anyway, uh, that's for. Other day. Every, uh, every day you offer the same love to others. So not only that you understand that, I, you get up in the morning and say, my heart is yours, Lord. I'm completely, I understand I'm completely accepted. I'm unconditionally loved. I'm forgiven. Right? Every morning you got to say this, right? And I'm considered extremely valuable to God because He sent this up for us. And number three, it says every day offer the same love to others. <laughs> so you receive love and you give it away you receive more love, and you give it away, and you receive more love, and you give it away, and all of a sudden you're just walking around with love. Man, we just always love people. How does she do that? How do, I mean, you don't know her life, but man, she's just like always just spewing love. How does that happen? Somebody that wrongs you, and you, instead of re re paying back what they deserve, you pay back with love. Amen. People don't understand that. The world can't get it. That's what draws people to God, because we're being like Him. Amen? Uh, John 13, 34 says, I am giving you a new commandment. Love one another in the same way that I love you. What did he do for you? He died for you. Died for others. What? Die for your wife. Die for your husband. Die for your children. Die for your, your boss. Die for the people around you. What does that mean? Jesus said in another verse, he said he came to serve. You serve people. So the love of God will be shown from you, will shine from you, will be revealed through you, so that we draw to Jesus. That's how it works. It's work. It's not easy. But they hated Jesus. They spit on him, pulled off his beard, slapped him, abused him, threw him on a cross, stabbed him. He went through a horrific death. Now God was just asking us to do the same. Romans 15, 7 says this, Accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Love them. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 7. Let's, let's, let, can we turn here? I'm going to close with this. I, wanted this. I was going to do this a little shorter because of time, but I think you guys think we were being patient today. Thank you for um, the gifts. Thank you for all that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How many know what this is about? Right? Everybody knows this is about love, right? <laughs> we named our daughter Charity, our firstborn, after this chapter. Verse 7. It is always, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Let me read that again. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. Love never, never, ever fails. When you love somebody, there's four things we have to remember. Love extends grace. 
right? When you're wrong or something happens, when you love, you extend grace, like God's extending grace to you, which means it's unmerited favor. They don't deserve my love. We didn't deserve God's love. But if we give that love to other people, then they'll receive God's love. Amen? Mm -hmm. They might not deserve it in our eyes because, you know, they're just whatever, they're bad people. They've done stuff wrong or whatever. They've made, they made fun of me. They mocked me or whatever. But if I extend love, they, you know, people don't know how to handle that. If you extend love when you're being wrong, they just, it blows their mind. They just walk away. Every time. Every time. It's just amazing what God does in that. You extend grace like God extends grace. And then they'll come back and ask you, why did you do that? Why did I do what? Why did you, like, forgive me? Because God forgave me. I didn't deserve forgiveness, but he gave it to me, and I want to give it to you. It's amazing how that works. Amen? Extend, uh, expresses faith. Love expresses the faith in God. Expresses the best in other people. And love endures the worst. That's what I want to close with today. I want you to take a moment. And I was going to have you play, but we're just going to end this bit over. Okay? Uh, I just want you to take a moment. Do I love? Am I hiding in the bushes like Adam and Eve? Am I not giving, revealing myself to everybody so I, the fullness of God could be showing out of me and the love would extend to me? And that's why I am. You know? What is it? What is holding you back? Would you just take a moment right now? Just bow right your heads. Just pray for a moment. Ask God to reveal to you what it is and just confess it to Him. One day we'll have it where everybody stands up and confesses it. We'll do that today. Right? What is God doing? What does God want you to change? We're in your life that maybe you could extend more love and more grace and more peace. What, what is it that you're dealing with right now? Every one of us is dealing with something. Lord, please forgive us. Let me take the liberty to say this. Some of us in the room today, it's our, our unbelief. Do I really believe God loves me? Do I really believe God cares? And I want to tell you from him, yes. A resounding yes. God loves you. And he is going to forgive you if you just ask him. Father, I'll do your work in everyone's heart this morning. Father, I thank you for these wonderful people, God. Father, as we run the race today, as we run this race, Father, I pray that every one of us win the prize. We reflect your image across the world. I thank you so much, God. I pray your blessings on every, every person here, God. All oh, those that couldn't make it, God. I pray for those that even had to leave early today. I pray, God, for the new people that you're bringing. I pray for the, I thank you for the, the worship team and the children workers, God. I thank you for all the, the changes that you're doing in our individual lives and in the life of this church, God. I thank you, Father God. I pray, God, every morning as we get up. We'll take a moment and ask you to show us your love. And we'll give our heart and surrender our hearts to you, God, so we can reflect you in the world. And I thank you, folks, for that so much, God. Bless your children today. Bless your children, Father God. In Jesus' holy name. Amen.